Welcome back to Viewpoint. Last week, an investigative report by the Associated Press revealed New York City Police Department, with help from the CIA, was spying on ethnic communities as part of their intelligence operation. My next guest is Matt Apuzo, the AP reporter who helped break the story and co-wrote the investigative report. Matt and his colleagues were awarded the 2011 George Polk Award for Journalism for their work on the story. I meant to say last year it was done. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Jim. Um, the, the story itself. Yeah. Um, before I get into it, how did you come on it? What, 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 what broke it for you that there was a problem here and, and led you down this path? Well, for me, it was, and, uh, and our team, it was much less about a, a problem that we saw. It's just this, this issue of, of how um, police departments, and particularly the NYPD, have shifted from solving crimes to preventing terrorist attacks. I mean, it's really a fascinating issue. And, and frankly, when you, when you really think about you know, what, that, what that means, it means we, we have a department that used to have to go and, and somebody would get killed and we go figure out who did it. Now they have to identify the killer before they kill. I mean, that's, it really is a 180 degree shift. So that's always been fascinating. Um, in the course of uh, our reporting, um, my colleague Adam Goldman and I um, began to, to look, we were looking into CIA accountability and we were looking into other stories along those lines. And, you know, we began to hear about this CIA involvement with the New York Police Department, which was fascinating to us. And as we sort of started to gather string, we are like, well, what are they doing there? And, oh, they're helping build these intelligence programs. And as we started to do more and more reporting, we began to hear things like mosque crawlers, the idea of, you know, informants that just fan out into the mosques, and, and, uh, and rakers, these sort of plainclothes detectives who uh, hang out in ethnic communities and just write up daily reports about what they hear in cafes and hookah bars. So the story unfolded for you as you Over were... a very long time, yeah. I mean, yeah. we were on this for quite a long We've been writing pretty consistently since August. So, I mean, we're talking about, what, uh, six months now or so um, of, of consistency. So now source. tell me about the CIA involvement. They're banned from domestic surveillance Correct. activity. And yet they have uh, one and then later two people in the New York City Police Department, um, directing traffic, setting up programs, right. um, does it not violate uh, restrictions on CIA domestic surveillance? Well, after our stories ran, the CIA's Inspector General looked into this and concluded that it did not violate. I go back, did it not violate the CIA? It, the CIA's Inspector General looked at it and said, we, we have not violated any yeah. laws, we've not violated our executive order, our mandate, um, we didn't do domestic spying. The inspector general did find that there was a, so probably some poor judgment, uh, a lack of oversight, um, a lack of accountability. Uh, I mean, what happened was the CIA sent a veteran officer to New York uh, after 9-11 to basically be George Tennant's liaison to, uh, to New York. Um, and in doing so, I mean, on the surface, he's supposed to help share intelligence. And, but in doing so, I mean, he brought his expertise. He helped guide and direct these domestic collections operations for the NYPD. And in some instances, what was being collected at the NYPD was sort of passed back channel to the CIA. Um, but, you know, he was really the architect of, of these programs. He, he did that while he was on CIA payroll. He later took a leave of absence from the CIA to stay on at the NYPD and then ultimately left the CIA to, to, to finish his career with the NYPD. Um, he left and was replaced recently, just, uh, just last year, last July, uh, by another extremely senior uh, clandestine operative, one of the most senior uh, spies in the CIA. He was replaced there and... Um, this is Sanchez. Sanchez was replaced by... Well, okay. He remains undercover, so we're not saying the new guy's name. Um, and uh, he's there now, and we were told the federal government says he's there on a, on a management sabbatical. He's observing the best practices of the... Of a, of, he's learning how to be a manager. He's already one of the most senior managers in the CIA. He's there to learn. And after the CIA's inspector general investigated, um, the CIA decided to, to pull him out early, and uh, he'll be coming home, I believe, in April, uh, nine months into a one-year term. Talk to me a little about the, this informant slash crawler phenomenon. Right. You write in the story how they develop informants. Right. It, it's, it's a well-known process. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine wrote a book on, 
on, on, on this whole issue right. um, of, uh, of, of getting snitches. The book is called Snitches. snitches. Um, and uh, they started by doing a whole scan of Pakistani cab drivers. Tell yeah, the story I mean, how that happened. Well, early on, I mean, they were just really desperate for, for informants. I mean, so they did. They, they ran the names of all the Pakistani cab drivers. And, of course, they're looking for who maybe has warrants. I mean, who might be uh, immigration issues. Anything that can give you leverage to, to try to get an informant. There was briefly a, uh, an operation where they basically sent patrol cars out into Pakistani neighborhoods and was like, look, any excuse you've got, if you've got a broken taillight, if you're speeding or on a stop sign, whatever, you know, pull them over. If we can find out if they have any existing warrants, you know, anything we can use for leverage to flip these guys. Over time, um, they built a, a, a very vast network of, of informants. Um, the goal was to try to get informants in every mosque. And, and they didn't actually achieve that goal, but they, we know they infiltrated dozens of mosques and student groups. Um, just today, in fact, just a few hours ago, we, we released some, some new documents that show uh, what these mosque crawlers were producing. And, and a really good example, I'm sure you remember the, the Danish cartoon about the, the mm -hmm. Prophet cartoons and, and the, the violent protests that were occurring overseas. So uh, the NYPD wanted to know, well, what are the Muslims in New York going to do about this? I mean, are they going to are they going to protest? Are they going to take to the streets? Will there be violent here? And and so they have this huge network of of mosque crawlers who report back on the sermons, and and all of that goes into the NYPD files. So we actually have this file that says, you know, imam after imam is saying. We should be offended by this. We should protest this, but we should do it peacefully. You know, violence is counterproductive. Violence goes against the core tenets of Islam. Um, and but you know, let's go. Let's go get a permit to protest. Let's let's boycott. Let's write mm. letters to our congressman. All of this is First Amendment stuff, but it's ending up in a briefing book for for Ray Kelly. So I mean, you know, it just shows how they're using using the the mosque informants. Um, to keep tabs. Just on. for the viewers, though, when you say flip, I, I want to explain. Sure. What that means is that. Uh, they would get the guy if he had an immigration problem or if he had a traffic violation or something that they yeah. could charge him with they would say we won't do it if you agree to right. be an informant Correct. so they'd flip him yeah. into becoming an informant and Correct. using intimidation that basically is how you get a snitch yeah i mean look uh right there's a negative so a snitch has a negative connotation right flipping probably has a negative connotation intimidation probably definitely has a negative connotation i mean in police work whether you're Terror, breaking down drug gangs or whether you're breaking down the mob or whether you're going after terrorists, developing informants is, is key. And I don't think anybody suggests the NYPD shouldn't be trying to develop informants to go after terrorists. I mean, clearly that is part of their mandate. So um, the, question, the question we've been raising is just where is, the, where is the line that in society today that we draw between how much surveillance and oversight and um, scrutiny is prudent on one group, one religious group, um, to find you know, one tiny, tiny, tiny uh, radical subsect of that group? I uh, uh, want to shift now to Rakers. Sure. They are undercover police officers. Yeah, I, the, the NYPD disputes the term undercover. It's undercover for you and me. Um, it's a plainclothes officer. He's a guy who shows up, he's not dressed as a cop, he doesn't identify himself as a cop. The NYPD distinguishes between plainclothes and undercover because they say undercover is we give you a fake identity, we give you a new address, you know. So they're not undercover like they're deep, the NYPD has deep undercovers. Um, they're plainclothes guys. But I actually know New York City police officers, Arab American police officers, who were told that if they did this, they'd give them a different identity to do it. Yeah, I mean, and that those were most likely part of SSU, the Special Services Unit. Those were the the, the deep undercovers. You get a new ID, yeah. you get a new name, a new you know a cover job. They give you an apartment, and you don't report back to headquarters. You report back through a handler. Um, you know, there was a there was there was an SSU operation, a deep undercover operation in New Brunswick, New Jersey, that nobody you know New Jersey didn't know about. Um, that actually got disrupted because they had a little apartment off of the Rutgers University campus, and the building superintendent thought uh, he went in because there was a report of a gas leak, and and he saw all these computers and all this terrorism literature, 
They thought it was a terrorist cell. So he calls 911, the FBI runs down, and it's like, oh, wait, no, this is an, F this is an NYPD undercover operation. Tell me about that. The, the, we've gotten recently a bit of a, a backlash in New Jersey. Yeah. With the governor, oh, yeah. the mayor, the police chief saying, you've been conducting activities in our city, and there was a story that you all came out with last week mm -hmm. about spying on Muslim students right. in campuses around the East Coast. Um, not the activity of the New York City Police Department. I mean, one would suggest that's well, what the FBI does, which is go beyond cross state lines. Uh, well, well, that's what, I mean, you know, really, when you come down to all of this is, it, this is the activity of the NYPD. I mean, the NYPD, the lesson, the takeaway from 9-11 was, we can't rely on the federal government to do this. We have to do this ourselves, we have to develop our own informants. We're not gonna be, we're, we're not gonna be chained in at the city line. Um, if somebody's plotting somewhere else, we're going to go there. If somebody may be, we need to keep tabs on them and they're in Boston or somewhere else. But isn't else. there a jurisdictional issue with, I mean, crossing state lines? Well, they can't arrest them, um, you know, but... But they can spy on them. Well, I, I mean, look, the NYPD says everything that, they, that they're doing is legal. Um, you know, look, I, I think it raises some real issues. If, if, one of these, if one of these officers is not deputized as a federal marshal, and and is following somebody in a car and and hits a kid in a crosswalk i mean the nypd officer is probably not covered to say oh you can't sue me because i was on my official capacity let me put this up there's a quote you have from ray kelly mm -hmm. police commissioner in which he said the following i want to put it up and ask you to comment on it he says the value we place on privacy rights and other constitutional uh, protections is part of what motivates the work of counterterrorism it would be counterproductive in the extreme, if we violated those freedoms in the course of our work to defend New York, there are those who would suggest that, in fact, they have crossed the line uh, by spying on Muslims, on Palestinians in, mm -hmm. in, in, as a separate community. Mm -hmm. You had documents on that released. Uh, going to mosques and recording what imams are saying and entering them into files, even though the comments were innocuous. I mean, is Ray Kelly protecting First Amendment rights uh, in the defense of, uh, of, of New York City? Or is he violating that? Well, I mean, I'm certainly not a constitutional scholar. And, and, you know, we've never set out to try to say what they're doing is illegal or even what they're doing is wrong. Um, but, you know, what's, what's fascinating about this is the NYPD's intelligence operations, unlike almost everybody else, operates with next to no outside oversight. So City Hall doesn't know what's going on. Congress, which is paying for a lot of this, doesn't know what's going on. It's unclear how much the Obama mm -hmm. administration knows what's going on. So what we've been trying to do is sort of shine, shine some light here and so that there can be these kinds of conversations. Is this protecting us? Is this protecting the Constitution or hurting the Constitution? We can't have those conversations unless, unless we know what's happening. And so a big part of what we've been doing is just trying to sort of shine a light in a dark corner. Uh, thank you for doing it. Thanks. The stories have been great. If you haven't checked out the AP stories, you should. Uh, it's worth doing. Um, uh, one question I yeah. was going to ask you is, has it produced any victories? And, and, uh, but we don't have time for it because we're, we're out of time. You got anything in the, in the works right now in the hopper? Uh, we're not done. We're staying busy. Still going on. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Thanks so much. Uh, that's all the time we've got. If you want more information, you can follow us on Twitter at AIUSA or you log on to our website, aaiusa.org. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week on Viewpoint. Anthony Shadid uh, died uh, this week, and I wanted to just give you a word about Anthony. He was a, a good friend of mine. He appeared on the show a number of times, an extraordinary journalist who built a bridge between America and the Arab world um, in many ways. The dispatches from uh, Iraq, from Lebanon, from Libya, and from Syria uh, far exceed what anyone else, uh, contemporary journalists, uh, uh, had been able to provide for us. Uh, he's an enormous loss for Arabs and for Americans who need to know more about the Arab world. We'll miss Anthony Shadid, um, and uh, his book's coming out in, uh, in March. I suggest you go buy it. It's called A Stone House. It's all the time we've got now. Goodbye, and we'll see you next week.